Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, we begin our next course, which is microbial keratitis, evidence-based medicine. And I have with me a galaxy of uh, speakers. Uh, workup of case in mic of microbial keratitis and bacterial keratitis would be dealt by me. Fungal keratitis uh, would be talked upon by Dr. Samar Basak, Director of Deshaya Hospitals, Barakpur, Kolkata, West Bengal. Uh, sir, may I please request you sir. to be on the dais? Acanthamoeba keratitis uh, would be uh, talked about by Professor Rajesh Sinha, uh, who is uh, uh, con senior consultant at RP Centre for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. Uh, then we would come to the surgical management, glue and dalk and microbial keratitis by Dr. Rajesh Pogla, Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad, and therapeutic keratoplasty and microbial keratitis by Professor J.S. Chityal, Chief of RP Centre, Ames, New Delhi. Uh, Rajesh Fogla is there, so I would request Rajesh to please come on the dais. Dr. Rajesh so, Fogla. Dr. Rajesh. Rajesh Fogla, <laughs> two of them are there. So, I would be talking to you about workup of case of microbial keratitis and bacterial keratitis, which would be dealt with similarly. There are no financial interests or disclosures, and this is how a case of bacterial keratitis would look to you. This is a classical case of pseudomonas keratitis with yellowish discharge, uh, yellowish greenish discharge, and a cornea which is uh, perforated. Symptoms we all are aware of, redness, sensitivity to light which is increased, visual acuity which is decreased, pain, discharge, associated conjunctivitis. And whenever associated conjunctivitis is present, it could be due to gonococci, pneumococci, or hemophilus. So this is what should be kept in mind. And the risk factors could be ocular, such as corneal abrasion, eyelid disease, contact lens use, prior ocular surgery or ocular surface disease, compromised corneas, or injudicious use of topical antibiotics, steroids, or traditional eye medicine. The risk factors could be systemic, uh, which would uh, be immunosuppressive drugs, burns, chronic alcoholism, severe malnutrition, AIDS, malignancy, and rheumatoid arthritis, and even extremes of age such as infancy and old age. Uh, these are the classical pictures uh, to see how uh, microbial keratitis or bacterial keratitis would look like. Uh, traditional eye medicine, honey, bacterial keratitis, then post LASIK keratitis uh, because of a buttonhole flap, and these are two cases where there was injudicious use of corticosteroids, following which uh, perforation and thinning has occurred. So in a slit lamp evaluation, this is the classical picture. You have to look at the area and density of infiltration, size and depth of ulceration, size of epithelial defect, degree of stromal edema, scleral involvement of any and AC reaction. And not only do you have to look at the size of the epithelial defect, because the size of the epithelial defect is always going to be different from the size of the stromal involvement or the inf infiltrate size of the infiltrate. So both should be monitored at each visit. And of course, you would also see whether the hypopion is mobile or it is, uh, uh, it is uh, not mobile, such as in this case it is mobile. That means it possibly rules out your uh, fungal keratitis. Grading of corneal ulcer is important, whether it is bacterial or fungal, because the treatment modalities for uh, each of the grades is different. So the way to learn is less than 2, 2 to 5, and more than 5, mild, moderate, and severe. Likewise, for depth, less than 20%, 20 to 50%, more than 50%, and infiltrate extent similarly, and scleral involvement is present only in the severe cases. Now, uh, this is just to show that the severe uh, forms of microbial keratitis have poorer outcomes, are likely to be larger, and likely to involve the posterior cornea, so that is why it is important to know the size of the ulcer. Now, classical features are present with, with organisms. So if you have a staph uh, microbial keratitis, you would have compromised cornea. The local borders are going to be distinct, and the non-edematous surrounding cornea is there, which is relatively clear. On the other hand, if you have a pneumococcal keratitis, it is a rapidly progressive serpiginous ulcer, hypopion with deep stromal abscess, and your surrounding cornea is also edematous. What has happened? Uh, Pseudomonas species, on the other hand, has ground glass stromal appearance with fulminant green discharge, infiltration, which happens in 24 hours, desmetocene and perforation, which can happen in two to five days. Mycobacteria, on the other hand, will have a classical cracked windshield-like appearance such as this. The surrounding cornea is quite clear and there's hardly any AC reaction. And this occurs after trauma and is generally indolent. 
So you can see that this is a classical cracked windshield-like appearance. Atypical mycobacteria uh, keratitis uh, can also occur. And uh, the picture is uh, classically like this. Again, it tends to have a cracked uh, windshield-like appearance and has multifocal uh, uh, infiltrates, as is shown here. Then Morexella is classically inferior, is oval, uh, hardly any AC reaction, and uh, seen in diabetics, alcoholics, and malnourished, and is generally indolent in nature. And Nucardia has a uh, uh, cracked windshield appearance and also a wreath-like pattern, which can be seen here, which is again indolent with elevated hyphate edges uh, and satellite lesions. Now, there are limits to clinical evaluation. In this study, in fact, two studies have clearly shown that you can distinguish between bacteria, fungal, and amoeba in almost three-fourths of the percent of the cases, depending upon your clinical examination. But for the uh, one-fourth of the cases, you still require microbiology, which remains the mainstay for any case of uh, microbial keratitis. So uh, the scrapes are taken uh, with, with, by using propericane and uh, from the leading edge of the ulcer and the center of the ulcer, and one can use a modified Kimura spatula, which most of us actually do not use. Uh, the most important stain, like I have always emphasized and everybody does, is KOH, because that will immediately tell you whether you have to start your antifungal treatment or not. And uh, grams has to be done in all the cases. And acid fast is for man. Man means mycobacteria, actinomyces, and nocardia. Uh, one does culture on blood agar, chocolate agar, and subroots dextrose agar. Uh, and uh, supplemental uh, media may be required, uh, LJ media for mycobacteria and nocardia, and for acanthamoeba, non nutrient E. coli. Now, everything that is related to the uh, microbial keratitis goes for culture whether it is a suture or it is contact lens, contact lens solution, contact lens case, uh, and the positivity rate for bacterial cultures varies anything between 40 to 73 percent. Now, you may have a lot of cases which are referred to you. So, Im important thing is that uh, you should uh, see whether you have a microbiology report or not. If the microbiology report is present and the ulcer is still not responding, then you have to look at three things, uh, compliance, resistance, and whether it is mixed or polymicrobial, you are missing some other organism. Uh, however, if the um, microbiology uh, report is not there and uh, there is no microbiological diagnosis, then one can stop antibiotics for 12 to 24 hours, re-scrape and send in special stains and culture and also on routine stains. And if it's a twice negative smear, then one does corneal biopsy. Now, for samples such as uh, post-LK keratitis, you may have to remove a suture because the infiltrate is present in the uh, interface. Or for cases like, uh, for cases like uh, infectious crystalline keratopathy after LASIK, you may have to elevate this flap and scrape uh, the area which is uh, there on the bed as well as on the surface. And of course, you may need to do a suture biopsy uh, uh, in cases where uh, the uh, epithelium is not involved but it is only a posterior corneal abscess or in cases of DSEC, uh, where only the graft is involved, the intravitreal scissors uh, may be required to obtain the sample from the DSEC lenticule. And like I said, uh, corneal biopsy may be required if you've not been able to obtain uh, microbiological diagnosis on smears. Uh, there are various treatment strategies. So for mild ulcers less than three millimeters in size, not involving the visual axis, one can start monotherapy with Oflox, Ciproflox, Gateflox, Moxiflox, and nowadays, uh, we've started a randomized control study, uh, both in collaboration with LV Prasad Eye Institute uh, at Hyderabad, where we are comparing levoflox with the uh, conventional uh, combination therapy. Uh, moderate ulcers, if they are more than three millimeters in size and involve the visual axis, one uses combination therapy with fortified kefizuline or tobromycin, which are uh, uh, in higher concentrations to cover for both the gram-positive and the gram-negative uh, bacilli. And I think in the initial part, initial 48 hours, it is important to emphasize that your treatment will go round the clock. Round the clock means even during the waking hours, at least for the initial 48 hours. And uh, there are fourth generation fluoroquinolones which are available and uh, we still depend on them, al although uh, uh, there is uh, resistance which has been shown and in mild to moderate bacterial keratitis, several of the 
randomized studies have compared uh, fluoroquinolones with combination therapy. If the ulcer is mild, uh, then uh, you can get away with the, um, um, with the fluoroquinolones, but if the ulcer is severe or is moderate, then you need to do give combination therapy. I think another important thing is uh, the resistance, which can occur even with the fluoroquinolones, uh, which is becoming uh, increasingly a problem. And these are the two studies of moxiflox vis-a-vis uh, -vis the combination therapy and gatiflox vis-a-vis -vis the combination therapy from our center, which we published with equivalent results. This is how you prepare uh, fortified kefazoline and fortified tobromycin for all those uh, who don't have a pharmacy and have to do it themselves. And this is how vancomycin, which is the last drug uh, which we generally keep, is uh, prepared. Additionally, one can even give amikacin and trimethoprim. Now, uh, this is a meta-analysis of uh, various studies, 1,823 subjects, uh, which looked at uh, combining the fluoroquinolones, comparing the fluoroquinolones with the combination therapy, and again, the results were similar. The adjunctive therapy will continue in the form of cycloplegics, anti-glaucoma medications, and I would talk about topical steroids. Systemic antibiotics are required for perforations, impending perforations, post-perforating injuries, scleral involvement, and for Neisseria and hemophilus. Now, the SCUT trial did teach us that topical steroids can be started, but uh, uh, one has to be careful, I think, in three uh, conditions or three places where the steroids uh, should not be started, uh, and that is uh, uh, nocardia keratitis, atypical mycobacteria keratitis, and fungal keratitis. You may start them with a loading dose of antibiotics have been given for 48 hours, and the culture and sensitivity report is in hand because to every microbial keratitis, infection is important, but so is also inflammation. And I think, although we've all worked on antimicrobials, there are very limited studies on anti-inflammatories for microbial keratitis, and this is where we need to work at. Of course, the clinical response, favorable signs would be decreasing infiltration in terms of area, density, epithelial healing, and decreased AC reaction. And whenever the ulcer is not healing, look for other organisms and other factors. So, uh, modify antibiotics only if there is no clinical improvement and taper when the clinical signs of improvement are there. And these are the specific antibiotics for uh, specific organisms, for MRSA, vancomycin, for severe pseudomonas keratitis, septazidine, for mycobacterium, fortitum, uh, amikacin, and for nocardia keratitis, amikacin or trimethoprim can be given. Uh, these are the AO recommendations of 2018, and much of this I have already crystallized and talked to you about. And there is, of course, a problem of resistance, and you see the way exponentially the articles on antibiotic resistance are increasing systemically, and uh, there is also uh, the same resistance which has also been reported for the ocular data as well. Uh, and this uh, ever, this keeps increasing. There are newer combinations and formulations which have been tried anecdotally, topical piperacillin, linozolid, colistine, emipenem, uh, and when nothing works, then these are the drugs that we resort to. So uh, for multidrug resistant bacterial keratitis, linozolid, uh, 2 mg per ml, colistin, and emipenem are the three drugs uh, which can be used. This is uh, topical colistin, 0.1%. Uh, again, this is the way we prepare it uh, for all those who don't have a pharmacy uh, uh, to, to help them to prepare it. Again, these have shown promising results, but there are no long-term studies or trials uh, to talk about it. So uh, how to prevent resistance? You use a very low dose uh, or two short duration of antimicrobial usage would increase antimicrobial resistance. So don't taper it, just stop it when you have to, uh, when you think that the response is there. Use the right antibiotic and uh, use antibiotics only when they are of benefit. Uh, do not taper antibiotics, stop at the therapeutic dose. Uh, again, uh, there is no proven role of vitamin C and doxycycline uh, or any of the anti-inflammatories, and this is something I think which we need to uh, look at. Uh, we can, if we have time, discuss about uh, the uh, uh, collagen cross-linking in microbial keratitis. But I think we need to rewind, reevaluate, and redefine our approach uh, as to how we are going to be treating bacterial keratitis 
uh, in a more effective way because resistance is something that we will have to stay with. So these are the sequel, if it doesn't respond, and this should be the healing of the corneal ulcer over a period of time that we all are aiming at. And uh, we are going to be coming out with the second edition of this book, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Namrata, for a very nice and comprehensive talk on uh, bacterial keratitis. Uh, yes, sir, please. May I, uh, may I invite uh, Professor J.S. Titial, uh, sir, sir, on the dais, and uh, Dr. Sonal Tuli, who is our international guest faculty uh, from uh, Florida. Please, uh, can you come up to the dais? Join us. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yes, we can take up the questions now. Ma'am, uh, sometimes in our clinical practice, we come across cases of uh, these uh, microbacterial ulcers, where for first two days we find that uh, either they are very slowly responding or they are at least not deteriorating. Day three, suddenly you find that as if the picture has turned into a uh, pseudomonas infection. So what is this kind of change of pattern of these ulcers uh, during their course of presentation? Any comment from you? So I think uh, if it is responding within 48 hours and then there is, a, there is a change in the way it is behaving and it suddenly deteriorated, then one has to look and think about uh, super added infection because that infection which is there uh, has an epithelial defect and it is already infected and there is every possibility that there is a super added infection, you know, which has uh, caused this. It could be a mixed infection or it could be a polymicrobial infection. So I think that is what one has to look at. And you, like you rightly said, pseudomonas keratitis, in most cases, would, to begin with, only is quite devastating, is quite severe. But uh, I don't know, but there are several other organisms also which would you know, behave uh, similarly. Sometimes even uh, fungal keratitis, especially because of fusarium, may have a very severe course, and uh, it starts to deteriorate very fast. So I think you have to be aware about those organisms which behave like this and also be careful that there may be a super added infection by some other organism apart from the one which is already there. And at what state would you recommend TK for such cases? Therapeutic keratoplasty I would recommend. I think there's a whole talk by Professor Titial on this, but uh, it should be done. The idea of doing a therapeutic keratoplasty is that when there is an impending perforation or perforation or with a maximal medical therapy, your, uh, your ulcer is not responding. And I would never, never let it go till the limbus. Because if an infection goes to the limbus, I know that from a relatively uh, good prognosis or uh, optimum prognosis, prognosis the, the case has you know, fallen into a, a bad prognosis case. So I would never uh, let uh, microbial keratitis or exudate go right up to the limbus, would do a therapeutic keratoplasty before that. Any role of giving uh, anti-glaucoma drugs simultaneously with? I think uh, that depends on a case-to-case -case basis, and that can be given. Thank you. Thank one you. Of, uh, and just one Thank comment. One of the reasons for uh, contamination of the drug, a lot of reports has been come, especially when you are treating with uh, for a fungal ulcer, then pseudomonas come, reports come, that even the natamycin contains pseudomonas organism. Yeah. So be, be careful about the drop. Drop uh, itself. Patient is it. using, that is the most common source of pseudomonas, uh, super added infection in our country. So, yes. can I start? Yeah, so thank you, ma'am. And Please. now we invite Dr. Samar Basak for okay. his talk on fungal creditis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Namrata for having me here. And uh, I'll be talking fungal keratitis standard uh, medical therapy, interstromal and intracameral injection. I do not have any financial interest to disclose. You see that most of the fungal keratitis is reported from tertiary centers, and they are predominantly fungal or mixed. In tertiary level, standard of treatment is fairly straightforward because the microbiology workup is there. On the other hand, in small clinic and mostly they are the primary cases and many situations the treatment is empirical. So, but empirical management, you must have more knowledge than you are having microbiology backup. 
So and you, you need to knowledge about the clinical presentation of different types of keratitis, different pictures of different fungus, geographical distribution, especially in India, we know that Aspergillus is more common in Eastern and North India, Fusarium is more common in South India, then urban versus rural population, and also, you know, the predisposing factor like paddy seed or paddy related injury, aspergillus is common, whereas onion related injury, fusarium is common. So everything should be kept in mind before starting empirical management. And sensitivity pattern might be different in different parts of the country. You have to remember all those. So you start empirical treatment, be rational, See for 48 to 72 hours, if it is not responding, refer to a specialist who have those facility of microbiology workup and other supports. So AIOS guidelines are there, size, shape, location, depth, and presence of hypopion or not. And primarily, if you want to do one test microbiology, please do KOH preparation and see yourself under the microscope. You can actually group them differently. There are many antifungals available, pollins and azole. We know that the natamycin and amphotericin B both are available in our country, but amphotericin B you have to prepare yourself. Azole, boriconazole is available in our country, but other uh, azoles are available in the form of tablet or injections. So there are different sensitivity pattern is there, and we know that amphotericin B is more sensitive for aspergillus or yeast kind, whereas natamycin is mostly sensitive for all. Then key points to remember that all available antifungals are fungistatic, not fungicidal. Natamycin is the drug of choice in filamentous keratitis, especially against fusarium. And due to poor penetration, it is only effective in non-severe, more superficial keratitis. Amphotericin B is effective for candida and aspergillus. Fluconazole also shows activity against candida species. Role of scraping is there. On first visit, it is a must. Repeat scraping depending upon the response, help in decreasing microbial load. It also helps in penetrating the topical antifungal. But for dematiseous fungus, probably you would need to uh, scrape the ulcer on each visit, maybe on alternate day or on a daily basis. Monotherapy, depending upon the size, shape, hypopion of the ulcer, so natamycin or M4B is the choice, cycloplegic antibiotic. And depending upon the response, initially, uh, you give one hourly, as Dr. Namrata said, even the sleeping hours, you try to motivate the patient, then review initially on alternate day or third day, then weekly, and depending upon the response, you, you, you tapering the dose or may, may start combination therapy. The MART trial has shown that, that boriconazole should not be used as a monotherapy, uh, so that has been proved. Uh, again, the in vitro studies showed that the natamycin and boriconazole in combination are uh, a little bit more effective in fusarium species, but not in vivo. Combination therapy for one night, more than five millimeter, endothelial plaque, sclera involvement, maybe after 10 to 14 days when you uh, think that it is not effective. But amphotericin B and natamycin are not synergistic in vitro. A role of systemic antifungal is there where limbus is involved, one eyed patient, sclera is involved, and in case of perforated, you can have uh, oral fluconazole, etroconazole. Boriconazole is uh, uh, doubtful and it is too toxic and also too expensive. Uh, systemic toxicity of all antifungals should be kept in mind. Matral 2 also showed that uh, uh, there is no uh, beneficial effect if you add oral boriconazole to your treatment. And, but uh, uh, fusarium keratitis may be benefited from oral boriconazole uh, to topical. There is only, but ultimate outcome, there is not much difference. How long is to continue antifungal? The dictum is just judge the ulcer, but the rule of thumb is, is continue the, your treatment for another two weeks in tapering dose. 
and ask the patient to come because some small hyphae or anything may be, you may not see it, may be in the angle of the anterior chamber and see for any recurrence after two weeks, then you cure healing. Then targeted therapy, intracameral, intrastromal, various things are uh, described, you just remove it, the plaque and the hypopion, and uh, you give intracameral, like amphotericin B, intrastromal amphotericin B, or intracameral, various combination, but the reports are all anecdotal. So you, you give injection in the clear zone surrounding the ulcer, and uh, many, many studies are there, indication that it is mainly for endothelial plug where the superficial stroma, anterior stroma is absolutely fine. There are many anecdotal reports. Some says it is good, some says it is not good, but when there is no thing, nothing in your hand, you may try, but randomized control trial by Namrata and uh, her group showed that Intracameral amphotericin doesn't offer any benefit over topical antifungal therapy when performed alone or associated with drainage or fibropion. So, but we have tried, sometimes it worked. Then again, intracameral voriconazole, uh, people are trying, but you must remember the half-life of intracameral voriconazole. It is only 22 minutes inside the eye, so you need to repeat every day probably. So. Uh, there are also, again, anecdotal report. Some people are saying there are, uh, uh, these are effective. Combination of intrastromal uh, uh, amphotericin B and voriconazole. Uh, uh, amphotericin B is sometimes effective and maintained uh, there for uh, up to seven days, so we may need to refeed it. And then it, uh, it is for deep keratitis also. People, a lot of reports are there. And again, the uh, topical versus intrastromal voriconazole, again, <laughs> by Namrata and her group says that uh, intrastromal voriconazole didn't provide additional benefit over topical voriconazole. This is one of the cases we treated with intracameral amphobi with intrastromal voriconazole long time back. Uh, so two doses after five days and this uh, typical uh, deep endoexudates cleared up very nicely. So in summary, this study says that all are anecdotal, but complications are there. You must remember UVIT secondary glaucoma and iris neovascularization, and subsequently bleeding during therapeutic PK. And there is uh, uh, no advantage of intrastromal voriconazole. And there are also uh, studies like in DMEC or DALC, when there is uh, DMEC or DSEC, whereas there is uh, uh, deep uh, stromal, then uh, in the interface you may try to give stab incision and a little bit of boriconazole and uh, there are reports that it may be effective. So it may, you may try it. The THT protocol, this is available in Cornea Journal. You must see it totally by Namrata and her group, the topical, systemic and targeted therapy. So all the algorithm is there, when to give, when not to give and I think that this, this is wonderful uh, algorithm. You must all follow this. So take home message is timely standard medical treatment is the key to success in most cases of fungal keratitis. For smaller superficial ulcer, monotherapy with natamycin mostly and maybe amphotericin B. Natamycin is most effective in fusarium. Amphotericin B is effective in aspergillus and candida. Boriconazole is less effective in fusarium species. Combination therapy with polyin and azole may have synergistic effect. Intracameral amphobi may have value in deep keratitis with endoexudate. And intrastromal boriconazole does have role in some of the candida infection where the, in the interface kind of infection, but not in filamentous fungus. Thank you very much for your patience waiting. Sir, uh, thank you for that wonderful overview. Uh, any questions? Is there any role of uh, intrastomal voriconazole in full thickness uh, uh, keratitis? Sorry? Is there uh, any role of intrastomal voriconazole in case of the cornea is involved in full thickness? Full thickness corneal involvement with the 
full thickness infiltrate in the cornea and uh, is there any role of uh, full thickness yeah. fungal keratitis fungal keratitis yeah. fungal keratitis full thickness intrastromal varicocele no, no in case of full thickness infiltrate of fungal keratitis is there any role of varicocele intrastromal varicocele in yes ah, there is yes. a role because the, your topical yeah. antifungals do not penetrate yeah. uh, uh, well so even if you give an injection which is at the level of say 70% or 60% then some of it would penetrate so there is a role of uh, uh, intrastromal varicocele there also so uh, any uh, anything like uh, depth of the in injection any change in depth, depth of infection uh, injection so in depth the of the injection would change it, it would change and of course like when you're giving so, so no, the, the, the causative organism is very important in this case. If it is like uh, candida, you uh, always try to give in. But it is a proved fusarium. Probably your, all this injection will not help to, uh, I mean, rather than you, 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 you can give uh, systemic other azole group because uh, voriconazole is too expensive and too toxic. Actually, so that is my so view. Actually, actually so his question is that what will be the depth of so depth, depth of injection? Yeah. Seventy-five percent, yeah. sixty that to seventy-five percent depth. Yeah. You can, but you must be very careful in post yeah. keratoplasty. You are telling now uh, without keratoplasty. If it is a post keratoplasty, you have to be very careful about the host graft so, junction and so, all these things. Yeah. So when you are giving these injections, you have to give in three to five hemi meridians, preferably five to six hemi meridians from an area which is relatively clear, not thinned out area because you might cause a perforation there. And the, the uh, reflex of that is something like the reflex of a phaco wound when you hydrate. So you know that it is there and that fluid wave you can actually see. So in five to six meridians you can give this. And if you have to repeat, then you repeat after 72 hours. Okay. And you can give about four injections yeah, uh, uh, thank you, thank you. 72 Namata. hours apart. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go on to the next talk, which is to be given by Professor Rajay Sinha, who is uh, going to talk about uh, not very common, but very serious uh, disease, infection of cornea with uh, acanthamoeba. And we know that acanthamoeba keratitis can be very, very difficult to treat. And he'll highlight all the you know, uh, difficulties to be solved in this group of cases. Dr. Thank Rajay you, Sinha. Thank you, sir. And uh, as uh, Professor Titalis said that it's not a very common condition, not a very common keratitis, but many times what happens that people, in order to, uh, you know, uh, when you have this concept that it's not very common, then you don't keep this in mind and many times you miss it as well. So you have to keep it in mind, although it's uh, less than 1% of all microbial keratitis. Uh, you have to clinch the diagnosis based on some risk factors as well. Somebody who is a contact lens user, who slept with contact lens or who uh, did swimming while using contact lens and then coming with some symptoms, you have to suspect that it may be keratitis. Somebody who is using tap water for cleaning the contact lens. Uh, uh, I mean, there was a study in uh, UK uh, on uh, tap water and they found out that 80% of the samples of tap water had some uh, amoeba in it. So uh, we can expect definitely that in our country as well. So all these factors can help you to think about uh, canthamoeba keratitis as well. You have to keep it in mind. It is mostly unilateral, has severe pain in immunocompetent patients, but those who are immunocompromised like HIV positive or, or uh, you know, established diabetic patients, they may have painless acanthamoeba keratitis as well, and many times we diagnose, as I said, when it fails to respond to all the other antimicrobials. So, as I said, the symptoms can be pain, redness, photophobia, and blurring of vision, and on examination, in the initial part, which very uncommonly you get, uh, uh, there can be epithelial irregularities or form uh, uh, lesions, which can be seen. They can be patchy stromal infiltrates or the perineural infiltrates, but these are definitely pathognomonic, but these are not very often seen. The patient comes to you with something like ring infiltrate and, you know, severe infection. Something like this, when you examine the patient, you get a ring infiltrate. Ask the patient whether the patient is using contact lens. If he has used contact lens, it can. This ring infiltrate can be because of two reasons. One can be pseudomonas, the other one can be a canthamoeba. If it is very rapid progressing, then it is pseudomonas. If it's not rapid progressing, it is slow progressing, then it can be a canthamoeba. So based on a 
on the initial history itself, you can, uh, uh, you know, somehow guess that what is it. Oh, yeah. And as I said, it's a slow progressing, doesn't have much vascularization. But if there is scleritis or limbitis, then you can have vascularization like this, or you can have scleral nodules, which can thin out with time. And this is one case wherein there was a fleeting type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, scleral nodule that we saw. And throughout 360 degrees, the patient had nodule, and then there was a trophy, and then again there was a nodule. So such a thing can happen. And based on history and based on examination, you can uh, somehow guess that it may be a ganthamoeba. But yes, microbiological diagnosis is something which we should always do in all the ulcers. We do corneal scraping. We can do confocal microscopy. And uh, uh, by confocal, you can get to see thickened nerves. You can get to see these, uh, uh, you can see here the thickened nerves will be seen like this. And then uh, as you move forward, you can see the double walled cysts. And then as you move anteriorly, you get to see the uh, refractile trophozoids in the basal epithelium of the cornea. And on staining with calcrophore white and uh, uh, you can get to see this apple green fluorescence uh, of the double wall cysts. Trophozoids are difficult to stain. When you send the, 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 the sample for culture, you send it in non-nutrient agar with uh, uh, live or killed gram-negative bacilli. And uh, wherever the canthamoeba feeds on these, uh, these uh, E. coli, there's presence of depressions or trails. And on serial transfer, you actually confirm that it is a canthamoeba and not uh, macrophages, which can also cause pseudotrails. And PCR has been shown to be a very effective tool in, in diagnosing a canthamoeba, uh, apart from other investigations. Uh, as far as uh, treatment is concerned, it is definitely a challenge because many times we don't get uh, these uh, definitive uh, drugs. Bigonide is the treatment of choice, chlorhexidine or PHMB. 0.02%. PHMB normally is not available uh, in the market, but there is a company that's called Arch, which has a, uh, which uh, uh, sells uh, uh, PHMB in a concentration of 20%, uh, and that can be bought and that can be made 0.02%. Diamidines, again, not freely available, but if it's available, it can be used, and both the drugs can be used as a combination therapy, one hourly for 48 hours, and then of course, you can reduce depending upon the response. Systemic therapy with uh, azoles are again useful in these cases. And a new drug that is miltifosin, which has been used in uh, animal studies. And also, there are a couple of reports, one with systemic miltifosin and one with topical. And they have shown good result, but these are just one of case. And uh, maybe with time, this is that uh, study that has been published in uh, the American Journal of Oral Miltifosin for refractory acanthamoeba keratitis, wherein miltifosin was given 50 milligram three times a day, but this is just one case, and we have to know more about it. As far as steroid is concerned, it is not uh, routinely given, but if there is scleritis, in that case, we can give system, we can give steroid and uh, undercover of bigonides. And sometimes the scleritis doesn't respond, so you have to give a long-term mycophenolate which can be started 500 milligram twice a day, increased to 1.5 with time, and then later on you can stop it. Supportive therapy, as we all know, is very essential because these patients have a lot of pain, and many times the NSAIDs don't help. You have to resort to opioid drugs, and sometimes these patients do require lignocaine or amitriptylin patch as well, and a couple of patients have used them, and the patients have, have uh, you know, really benefited and had reduction in pain. CXL and PTK, there are a couple of just reports not yet established in this. And the last thing that uh, people would like to do is that if it is not responding to any drug, then we have to do keratoplasty, lamellar, or penetrating. Lamellar, of course, if it's not involving the full thickness, and penetrating if, if it's uh, full thickness. But the key is that the risk of recurrence is high after keratoplasty, so we have to give medical management initially to some extent so that there is some limitation of the infective load and then after that we can go ahead with the with any sort of keratoplasty. So thank you very much for your patient listening and uh, anything, any suggestion, any uh, question if you would. Thank you, thank you Rajesh. Uh,
for highlighting the you know acanthamoeba keratitis management. We'll take questions towards the end. Uh, we now like to invite our uh, guest speaker to deliver the keynote address today. And um, the talk is based on a non-infectious uh, keratitis. We know that's a large gamut of uh, uh, disorder affecting the cornea. And uh, we have a person who's had a lot of experience in this, uh, Dr. Sonal Turi. She's from Florida and she's going to talk about this uh, entire gamut in a uh, very precise and uh, manner which we all would understand. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, Rajesh and Namrata giving me the opportunity to present here today. It's really great to be back in person. I haven't been to India for three years, so it's really nice to be able to come back and see everybody, uh, old friends, I guess not old friends, but long-term friends in person. So I'm gonna be talking about non-infectious keratitis, or as I like to call it, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, you've seen some excellent presentations today about all kinds of infectious keratitis, uh, and you see a lot of those. In Florida, we do see a lot of infectious keratitis, but about 50% of the patients that I see with ulcers are non-infectious. And so really what you want, I want you to think about is when should you start thinking that this is a non-infectious ulcer? I have no disclosures, but this is, as you know, an infectious keratitis. This is your typical pseudomonas or gram-negative infection. You see a lot of purulent discharge, a very ill-defined ulcer, there's a hypophion, and you might start seeing a ring uh, because there's an antigen in the center and, and bodies coming in from the periphery. Um, so what we're going to look at some other ulcers, and you're going to think about what is different about these. So looking at this ulcer, you can see that you've got the infiltrate in the center, but a lot of whitening around it. A very well-defined ulcer, and even though you think that this might be an infectious keratitis, the discharge is not purulent. It's tearing. Uh, they're tearing from the eye. They've got a lot of pain. And given this whitening and the, the amount of pain that they have with this, you're thinking it's not neurotrophic, right, because they have pain. They are tearing, but they're not producing any discharge. And so ask them to close their eyes and look for exposure keratitis. So especially if you see an inferior ulcer that has minimal discharge, you see a lot of whitening around the ulcer, and that tells you that this is a chronic problem, not an acute problem, because that would have ill-defined purulent margins, and then they will have discomfort, which distinguishes this from a neurotrophic ulcer. Um, how do you manage that? Um, just like you would any other uh, ulcer, uh, non-infectious ulcer, you lubricate it, you keep the eye closed, tarsorophy, moisture goggles. Um, sometimes you can even put a bandage contact lens so that this area doesn't get exposed. And a lot of the patients that we see with these are in the burn unit where they can't close their eyes, but you also don't have anywhere to stick a, a, a mask or uh, put goggles on. And you can use the, the clear wrap that you use for food on their eyes to protect it after you put uh, ointment on the eye. So here's another inferior ulcer. This one is very well defined, not a lot of infiltration. Again, no purulent discharge, which makes you start thinking not infectious. Uh, but also, it's a very dry eye. It's not a very teary eye. These patients will come in complaining of blurred vision rather than my eye feels like there's a rock in it. And so the moment a patient comes in and you see an ulcer on their eye, but they're not complaining of pain, you immediately start thinking of a neurotropic component. In this case, if you look carefully, my pointer won't work. Oh. Um, if you look carefully, you can see in the center, there are some keratic precipitates, which gives away that this is probably secondary to HSV or VZV. And similar looking ulcer here, well-defined margins, thickened borders, and we'll look at that in a moment, why the borders thickened. Um, but it's usually, why do you get these ulcers? Because patients don't have any sensation in their eye. They're rubbing their eye, they don't realize it. When something flies into their eye, they don't produce tears to wash it out of their eye. Uh, they don't have growth factors that are coming in from the tear film, so they cannot heal epithelial defects. And that causes a neurotrophic ulcer. Often it's very hard to distinguish, especially with somebody who's got a history of HSV. How do you tell HSV from a neurotrophic component because the treatment will be very different. If it's a neurotrophic ulcer after HSV, you probably want to put them on some steroids and not use topical antivirals because those are top toxic. So looking at what happens with HSV, you all know that the staining pattern, Rose Bengal stains the dead cells around the edges and fluorescein stains the epithelial defect in the center. In a neurotrophic ulcer, 
you have an irritated, inflamed base. So epithelial cells are being produced by your limbal stem cells. They come up to the edge of the ulcer, but they cannot heal across the ulcer, which is why you get these really thick gray edges. And then you have dead, dying cells in the center that cannot survive because of all the inflammation. So those stain with rose bengal. And then when you put fluorescein, they leak through that and cause a nice green glow around it. So what we call as reverse staining. And here you can see examples of it. Up here is, a, is an HSV ulcer, green in the middle, red on the outside. And here's a neurotrophic ulcer with a red on the inside and then this green glow on the outside. So that can help you tell that even though it looks like a dendrite or a geographic ulcer, this is not live HSV. This is a neurotrophic component. I want to put these patients on oral antivirals and steroids probably to help it heal. How do you heal any other neurotrophic ulcer? You want to lubricate, just to put lubrication in there to, um, to diffuse the growth factors that they might have. Uh, bandage contact lenses, hypertonic saline, and then of course things like autologous serum, which will give you serum-based growth factors in the eye. So that'll help it heal. There's epithelial growth factor, there's IGF. And then of course in the US, I don't know if it's available in India, but we have the recombinant nerve growth factor drops um, that can be used to help the epithelium heal. Very, very expensive, very hard to use, but they are effective. Uh, we do use amniotic membranes for these, and the reason for that is that the basement membrane, which is the top surface, has uh, collagen and laminins and fibronectin that help epithelium grow. And then the base, the stroma, has growth factors. It has anti-VEGF, so it prevents inflammation. So the combination of the two helps epithelium heal. Uh, we've done a few of these neurotizations. I don't know if that's done here regularly, but what you do is you take a nerve from the, the leg, and you connect the, the supratrochlear trochlear nerve from one eye, the normal feeling eye, to the opposite side. And then you break up that nerve into its little pedicles, like a little octopus. And you put it around the eye that has the neurotropic uh, component to it. And these nerves then grow into the eye and re, um, re I guess, neurotize it um, so that they can get sensation back. It doesn't always work, but when it works, it works very well. They initially feel the sensation on the opposite side, but then the brain learns to feel it on the right eye. So what's wrong with this picture? It looks like a neurotrophic ulcer, but this one is superior. You don't typically get neurotrophic ulcers superiorly because it's protected. The other thing you're looking at is this grayish material in the center. And so this tells you that something is going on in the upper lid. You see a lot of this, way more than we do. Um, and then you can see here the epithelial defect and a lot of toxicity around that. Flip the lid and you see that this is a patient with VKC and what they have is a shield ulcer. It starts out looking like uh, farinaceous, which is sort of like atta, thrown on the cornea, and then it combines into this ulcer with this um, material, dead material in the center. To treat it, uh, besides the treatment for VKC, you really have to debride this material off of the ulcer and then put a bandage contact lens to put a barrier between the eyelid and the cornea. What's wrong with this picture? You have a ring ulcer. Why do you get rings? Because there's an antigen in the center, like a fungal ulcer, antibody coming in from the periphery, from the limbal stem cells, uh, from the limbal vessels, and they meet in the center to form a ring. But here there's no antibody in the center. There's no infiltrate. So that, and this is a, both eyes of one patient. Uh, and you, this, uh, you can see from this eye that there's very dry, lots of epithelium missing. This is actually alkane toxicity, so anesthetic, topical anesthetic toxicity. So if you see ring ulcers in both eyes, especially if they have a lot of pain, but when you test their sensation, it is decreased, that should make you start thinking of uh, anesthetic toxicity. I won't talk about flectenules. You see a lot more of those than I do. I'll talk about one more thing. What is wrong with this picture? Typically, you get ulcers in the center of the cornea because that is avascular and it cannot fight infections. Here, you have an ulcer in the periphery. Uh, you shouldn't get ulcers in the periphery because your limbal stem uh, vessels should protect you. If you get an ulcer, especially this overhanging ulcer, that should tell you that the ulcer is coming because you have inflammation coming from the periphery, from the limbal stem cells, of the limbal vessels, I keep saying stem cells, um, and that tells you that this is probably PUK or Murin's. Um, so these are uh, the, the, the inflammatory mediators are going through the bloodstream and they get ejected out at the limbus and they cause a melt in the peripheral cornea. This is really important to diagnose because you can actually save this patient's life. 
the mortality with PUK is about 50% over 10 years. If you put them on immunomodulators, their risk goes down to 0% if you put them on the right treatment. You start steroids, you might want to cut the conjunctiva and throw it away so that there's less blood vessels near the limbus to uh, prevent the, the inflammation from getting to the limbus. Uh, and then you can use glue and you can use uh, little baby uh, PKPs um, to help uh, cause a barrier. Um, we we'll, won't talk about tetracyclines, but I do use these in all ulcers along with vitamin C. Low risk, but it may benefit because it prevents the matrix metalloproteinases from melting the cornea. And then steroids we've talked about earlier already. Uh, but use it if there's inflammation, don't use it if there isn't. Um, so again, too many symptoms, too little symptoms, location, the way the epithelial defect appears, if you have bilateral ulcers, start thinking of this. If they keep coming back, think it's non-infectious and look for associated problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tuli. It was a wonderful presentation and the documentation of cases so clear and it was uh, absolutely delightful to see those uh, pictures and the explanations given to the audience was wonderful. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla will uh, prepare uh, his presentations. Any question at this time for uh, Dr. Tuli? Okay. Dr. Tuli, do, uh, do you have uh, any sort of uh, uh, differentiation of these non-infectious keratitis in your part of, uh, and in, in Indian scenario, uh, like in terms of uh, uh, patient profile-wise? In, in the, your place also, you'll have a, you know, uh, a differential racial uh, inclination, like white and uh, this thing. Right, so we definitely see the vernals and the, the shield ulcers in the African-American population, not as much in the Caucasian, whereas we tend to see more of the HSV-related uh, neurotrophic uh, components in the, in the more Caucasian population. They've also more um, squamous cell carcinomas that have been removed and cut the, the trigeminal nerve, which can cause neurotrophic ulcers. So we definitely see a, a and then, of course, if I see a flick tenule, it's almost always from somebody in India uh, okay. because of the TB risk, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tulia. Dr. Rajan? Uh, I have one question for you. How, at what stage you would like to do a neurotization? We have done around 13 cases using plural nerve, and most of the cases are either herpes zoster or herpes simplex following the neuro paralysis. Uh, do you, uh, in your, it works only in around 50% of the cases in our hand. We have follow up of around nine months now. So in your hand, does the corneal haze or some opacity, they do disappear after a long term follow up? I have no, I mean, so What's we definitely, so again, we, our success rate is about 50% as far as getting the sensation back. We do put them on uh, the growth factor also at the same time, thinking that maybe that would help the nerves grow back. And so we don't know whether it's the neurotization or the uh, synergimin that, that helps with the, the, the rehealing. But certainly once their cornea becomes more moist, that uh, haze does tend to get better. Even if it doesn't get better, their vision improves. So they're very happy with that. Thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back then, the role of ATT. The role of ATT. Anti-tubercular treatment. Oh, absolutely, for, for flectenular keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. Um, so yes, yeah. so uh, interestingly enough, in, in the US, if I see it in, a, in an American person who has never traveled overseas, it's usually because of blepharitis, procedural blepharitis, so rosacea. So we'll treat them with rosacea treatment and we don't usually test them for tuberculosis. The people that we test for tuberculosis are the ones who've traveled overseas or are from a different country, usually from India or Africa. And then in those cases, I do put them on anti-tuberculous treatment, and they tend, so we obviously we put them on steroids topically for the treatment of the acute episode, but then to prevent future episodes, we do put them on anti-tuberculous treatment. If they have flectenular keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, that's almost a, a reason to put them on uh, anti-tuberculous treatment if they test positive. Yeah, th Great thank question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now we'd like to invite Dr. Rajesh Fogla. He's going to talk about, I think, very important areas like uh, glue applications, deep anterior keratoplasties in cases with infection or infectious keratitis. And uh, he's one of the leading uh, cornea faculty of our society and is a torchbearer of uh, 
India and across the world, uh, especially in the field of uh, you know, uh, cornea. And uh, we all admire his, uh, you know, the potential he's shown us in the international field. And we'd like to see his presentation. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, please. Thank you, Dr. Tityal. Good morning, everybody. I'll be talking about the role of glue and DALK in microbial keratitis. Uh, cyanoacrylate glue is commonly used in medical uh, surgical uh, specialties where they use it to close wounds without sutures or augmenting the suture. It's basically a liquid monomer which polymerizes on contact with liquids. Uh, if you have a corneal ulcer, uh, you can get a thinning or perforation either during the active stage of the ulcer when the, you have a lot of lytic activity and sometimes it can happen, happen during, even during the healing phase when the ulcer is beginning to regress, but because the cornea has become thin, it can uh, give away and you can have this kind of fetal positive. Now, in such a case, uh, cyanocryl glue is useful to seal wounds, which are at least uh, one to two millimeter in size. Now, uh, the way you apply is basically you take a plastic drape, you can punch out a two millimeter or three millimeter disc. Uh, you can cut out a cotton bud and use one end, you apply some ointment, then attach the small disc the plastic disc to it, and then put a drop of cyanocrylate glue on top of it. Uh, you, to prevent, uh, to dry the surface at the area of perforation, you put an air bubble in the anterior chamber, and then you debride the epithelium around the, around the site of perforation, because if you don't debride the loose epithelium, the cyanocrylate glue is not going to stay, and you can do that gently after you have uh, placed an air bubble into the anterior chamber. So you can see that uh, we are now trying to dry the wound. And the surrounding loose epithelium, you can use a dry merosol sponge, you can use a fine tying forceps, and you can gently uh, hold the epithelium and peel it off. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, there you can see that the loose epithelium is being removed. And once you have done that, then this uh, small uh, disc, which is attached to the cotton swab with the ointment, you just bring it and you can place that over the site of perforation. Uh, this method of application ensures that the surface remains very smooth, unlike a direct application with a 26 gauge or a 27 gauge needle attached to a tuberculin syringe. You can apply the fibrin glue, but often you apply excess amount of fibrin glue and what uh, the cyanocrylate glue, and the surface becomes very irregular. So here you can see that that's a small uh, disc that's there, and that either can be left behind or you can just peel it off. Uh, that comes off because the adhesive does not stick to it. And then you can put a large diameter bandage contact lens to cover that defect. That's how it looks post-operatively. Immediately, day one, day two post-op, you can see there's an air bubble in the anterior chamber. The eye is quiet. And at a month, you can see that the glue has dislodged, but the area of perforation has healed, and uh, there's some amount of scarring, which is in the paracentral cornea. Uh, when you have advanced infection, no response to medical therapy, or if you have large perforation, the tectonic integrity is compromised, you need to do a penetrating keratoplasty, a therapeutic keratoplasty, which Dr. Professor Titial is going to talk next. But I'm talking to see whether there is a role of performing a lamellar keratoplasty in infective keratitis. The uh, disadvantage of doing a lamellar keratoplasty is that you are potentially creating an interface and into which uh, you can have recurrence of infection. The advantage is that you retain the host endothelium, you have a closed chamber, so basically uh, the, open, the complications associated with the open globe can be minimized. Uh, so this is a paper from back from 2002 where they looked at the role of lamellar keratoplasty in treating fungal keratitis, but they instituted the surgical intervention very early, within seven days of the occurrence of infection, and they had favorable outcome in majority of their cases. Uh, and almost 93% and four cases only had recurrences. But we know that fungi can penetrate deep into the cornea and sometimes even cross across the intact decimus membrane. But there have been other papers uh, looking at the uh, treatment of uh, fungal keratitis using lamellar keratoplasty. This paper published in 2017 from Italy where again they used it for smaller ulcers which are confined to the central cornea, the depth not exceeding 300 microns and they used the big bubble technique, and they were able to uh, successfully uh, clear the infection using the DALC procedure. Another paper from China where they again used the big bubble DALC surgery. The recurrence rate was only about 9% uh, in their series. 
So basically, uh, yes, uh, in fungal keratitis, at least my experience, I have not done lamellar keratoplasty for fungal keratitis because the, the time frame at which the patient presents to us is usually much later. The in corneal involvement is much deeper. And if you do that, the chance of recurrence will be much higher. And our experience of treating fungal keratitis, we see a much higher volume of fungal keratitis than what they see in the West. And we have been able to medically manage them quite well. So I think uh, we tend to persist with medical therapy for a longer duration of time. So this is one of the uh, uh, photographs from the publication showing the central fungal keratitis, which was managed successfully using lamellar keratoplasty. This is a nice paper from Donald Tan's group from uh, SNEC Singapore, where they compared therapeutic DALG versus therapeutic PK, and they found that the success rate of eliminating the infection both with DALC and therapeutic PK is almost similar, but the risk of having severe complications like endophthalmitis was more when you do a full thickness therapeutic keratoplasty versus a DALC. The best corrected visual acuity of 6.9 or better was achieved more in the DALC group, and the long-term graft survivors were also better in the eyes which had the therapeutic DALC. That's some of their cases where they successfully performed the DALC procedure. Uh, the other indication would be acanthamoeba keratitis, and we all know that acanthamoeba keratitis is extremely difficult to treat medically. Uh, patients often uh, do not respond to the medical therapy, and if you keep continuing with the treatment, when the treatment, if the infection reaches up to the limbus or the sclera, then the battle is already lost, and sometimes despite the best of surgical intervention, you may not be able to successfully visually rehabilitate the patient later on. So even in this case, within 30 to 60 days from onset of symptoms, where the depth of involvement was less than 300 microns, they performed DALC and they found that they had successful outcome and they did not have any uh, recurrence of infection in their series. Uh, this is another paper from LV Prasad where they re retrospectively reviewed the DALC performed in cases of acanthamoeba keratitis. This is published in IGO in 2020. So they divided them in two groups, advanced uh, acanthamoeba keratitis versus um, early acanthamoeba keratitis, depending on the size of the infiltrate, whether it was more than eight millimeter or less than eight millimeter. But they found that the outcome was the one year graft survival and the eradication of infection was much better when the infection was less than eight millimeters. So the basic thing is that you want to do a therapeutic DALC, you have to take the decision relatively early before the infection has spread to the peripheral limbus. So this is a case of DALC, uh, acanthamoeba keratitis, where we had taken up the patient uh, for a therapeutic DALC, and here we tried creating a big bubble technique, so initial debulking was performed. When we injected there, uh, because of the infiltrate and the haziness of the cornea, initially we were not able to appreciate the formation of the big bubble, what we typically see in our cases, but then we saw that there was a type 2 bubble which was achieved, and we opened it up and successfully completed the surgery. Uh, you can see that we are removing the anterior stromal tissue to achieve a good clearance of the uh, infected stromal tissue. That's what it looked postoperatively. That's another case of acanthamoeba keratitis. Similarly, in microsporidial keratitis, where you don't have effective medical therapy, instead of resorting to a full thickness uh, graft, if the infection is limited to the anterior half of the cornea, you can think about doing a lamellar keratoplasty, which was done in this case, and you can see postoperatively that the patient had a clear graft. But you have to watch out for recurrence, because in microsporidial keratitis, recurrence is quite common. This is another patient, post smile who had infective, infective keratitis. So here also, instead of doing a therapeutic uh, penetrating keratoplasty, a uh, big bubble DALC was performed, and this patient also did well following the surgery. This is a patient where you had a perforation which was sealed with glue and amniotic membrane. That's how the patient presented with a large two to three millimeter perforation. We went ahead, did a DALC, and that's how the post-operative outcome was. So DAL can be performed even in the presence of large perforation. So basically, uh, it's, uh, it's a good option, uh, essential to eradicate infection, to maintain the integrity of the globe in microbial keratitis. Timing is critical, and surgical planning depends on the extent of involvement. The advantage of DALC is that it avoids endothelial rejection. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh Pogla. Nice demonstration of DALC. <laughs> He's the master of DALC in India. So I will now call upon uh, Professor J.S. Titiyal.
He will be talking on therapeutic keratoplasty in microbial keratitis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Basak, and uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Namrata Sharma for inviting me for this very, very uh, successful course for the last so many years. People come and attend. Uh, so th this shows that uh, we do require uh, initiation into a uh, look into a keratitis in our country and the treatment wise also. We've gone through the entire gamut of uh, different facets of infection in the eye, especially cornea, and their treatment. But you know that almost uh, every patient may not heal with your medical management. There are certain group of patients who requires a therapeutic uh, keratoplasty, and Dr. Rajesh Fogla did uh, talk about uh, cases where you can do a lamellar keratoplasty also. If you look into literature, around 12 to 70 percent of cases are very difficult to manage and may require a keratoplasty as such. So what are those indications where we might think of a therapeutic keratoplasty? What are the decision-making points by which we decide when to do surgery in these cases? Is there any change in the surgical technique of these cases? And most importantly, what would be the post-op management of these cases who had such a uh, terrifying infection in the normal cornea and what would happen after you transplant the donor cornea in these cases of such a severity of infection in these cases? There are bound to be complications also. So these are infections which we have seen in previous speakers' list. They would require a therapeutic keratoplasty assess. Just to look into the percentage of cases requiring therapeutic keratoplasty in one institution, this is RP Center. In our center, almost 45% of cases are amongst the all keratoplasty are therapeutic keratoplasty. That, that shows the importance of a therapeutic keratoplasty requirement in a referral institute like ours where we get a lot of patients referred with the infection which are end stage and they require a keratoplasty. Which are those cases where uh, you have more chance of therapeutic keratoplasty being done? If you see here, almost 50% uh, of cases are uh, either bacterial or fungal cases uh, in our group of cases. Very small number would be others like acanthamoeba and culture negative patients. But if you look into other area, which is around 34% is cases where you could not go get any culture in the treatment wise. So I consider these are a patient would be a difficult to manage medically, may require a subsequent infect, you know, keret keratoplasty in these cases. I think Dr. N uh, Professor Nepalia asked about when should we do a therapeutic keratoplasty. And timing is a very important consideration for getting a very successful outcome of uh, these uh, therapeutic keratoplasty in our patients. Documentation has to be absolutely perfect, not only for therapeutic keratoplasty, any sort of keratoplasty or any surgery where we remove the tissue from the human body. The documentation should be absolutely per perfect with counseling of these patients. Always use uh, good donor tissue. Better the donor tissue, outcome will be better, but sometimes we have to use uh, non-optical grade tissue also in these cases. Technique-wise, it's very simple. We like to save the eye, the uh, integrity of globe, remove the entire infectious load, and keep the normal uh, healthy corneal tissue of a patient and replace with the healthy tissue. Send the uh, button for a culture sensitivity to get a actual organism, if possible, Therefore, I think this last line, the timing of surgery is very, very crucial to achieve good success. And the surgery-wise, not different than any surgery you do in terms of full thickness keratoplasty. Unfortunately, most of the time, these surgeries are done in an emergency time, and maybe the younger sur corneal surgeon might be doing these surgeries, and they would uh, tell us that how difficult it is as compared to normal optical tissue, because Cornea is hazy, sometimes there's a perforation, hypotony, trephination becomes very difficult. So you have to do a gentle trephination without uh, risking the expulsion of uh, intraocular tissues. You may have to uh, do a manual dissection sometimes. Always prepare your donor tissues after the management of uh, host tissue in these cases. A lot of inflammatory membranes will be there that may require a proper dissection without damaging the underlying iris and lens in these cases. Bleeding may be there. Sometimes we have used uh, heparinized solutions to decrease the uh, these cob web uh, formation of inflammatory membranes. Peripheral iridectomy is necessity in all therapeutic grafts. Maybe uh, if not one, you may have to do two peripheral iridectomies in these cases to prevent the uh, pupillary block happening in a post-op period. 
interpret sutures should be put if possible at uh, tenon nylon sutures and don't hesitate in putting more sutures in these cases titration of sutures uh, strength also is difficult because the host may be atimatous similarly the graft may also be atimatous in these cases so you may require to handle the suture adjustment in the posterior period quite uh, regularly in these cases and sometimes the sutures are one indicator telling that what is going to happen in the posterior period. So suppose this is a patient who is undergoing keratoplasty. You have to mark the area of infiltration. Then go at least one millimeter beyond this to have a normal cornea so that you don't have a recurrence coming up in these patients. Divide the tissue in the multiple parts. Always get a histopad done and culture sensitivity. If needed, you can do a special uh, cultures and uh, specimen can be sent for other higher uh, investigations also. This is how, what you see in a post-op period. Timing is very important. This is one of our patients at 16 months also. This looks like an optical graft. So if you see this, is the periphery is not involved, non-healing ulcer, and the outcome is quite good if you use an optical tissue in these cases. So this is a larger uh, infection. You delayed. The graft quality may be poor, may not achieve the good results in long term. But you have achieved the saving the eye from infection in these cases. So you, may, you can do a subsequent optical graft or desec in these patients. So this is one of the patients you would have uh, chronic epithelial defect sometimes, which will go into PED and difficult management. In all infection cases, your graft is larger, periphery is uh, always vascularized, edematous. Epithelial healing may be a problem that should be safeguarded uh, every time. This patient is definitely going to have a very poor outcome. See the large ulcer and this is what happens. You know, this is a small ulcer, non-healing, do early surgery, you achieve a good graph. So this, all these photographs which I have presented here is to show that the timing is very, very critical and the assessment of patient has to be done appropriately. Yes, it all will depend the pathology behind also and that might uh, be the cause for recurrence happening in these cases. You all know larger graft, fungal ulcers, especially uh, uh, cases where you could not have the uh, diagnosis proper will have uh, more chances of recurrence happening. If you look, look into this, I talked about PED, suture related problems is very, very critical in our uh, country. Otherwise, sometimes we don't uh, really look into systemic and local factors. As Dr. Tully talked about, there are so many other Causes for uh, you know, a perforation, peripheral thinning happening, which may subsequently cause uh, secondary infection in these patients. Post-op management is uh, very, very important in these patients. Systemic antimicrobial should be used for uh, all cases, bacterial or fungal, for an appropriate time, before surgery and after surgery. Fungal may be for uh, another two to four weeks, depending on how patient behaves. Viral keratitis, yes, you have to give for a long, long time, sometimes for a 12 months also. But looking at topical antimicrobials, we all will be very happy to use for uh, bacterial cases. Fungal keratitis, again, continue for long term. And viral keratitis, uh, it doesn't normally help giving a topical medications, and same holds true for acanthamoeba also. So this is very critical to supplement the systemic and topical medication with these patients. What about topical corticosteroids? I think that is a critical question we every time get from the audience. When should we start uh, steroid in these cases? Bacterial keratitis, you can start very early. If you have a diagnosis in your hand, you have a bacteria sensitivity in your hand. Fungal keratitis, most people will wait till the epithelization happen. Then see how the patient uh, behaves. Maybe two weeks is an early time to start steroid in these patients. And similarly for viral keratitis, you can always give uh, steroids safely in these cases. Acanthamoeba, you have to be a little careful, uh, especially if a uh, patient behaves well. But if patient has a significant inflammation, you may have to see the, uh, start steroid early in these cases, except for a fungal corneal ulcers. Cycloplegics, tuber tear substitute, anti-glaucoma is uh, compulsory for all these patients. Anti-glaucoma is much more needed because sometimes the pressure may be very difficult to control after therapeutic grafts because of inflammation going on, peripheral antisynechia, pupillary block. You can have all sorts of glaucoma happening in these patients. You may require a IB mannitol. You require all sorts of uh, topical medications also. Success-wise, most cases do very well. If you have a bacterial, success is almost 100%. Same for a viral. Fungal, yes, so slightly less in all these cases. Infection in a lamellar grafts like a DSEC, DMEC is difficult to treat. Same holds true for a post-refractive surgery uh, infections. So this is one of our cases which started with just an ICK type picture. We did a 
Dalk seemed to do well, but after four weeks, patient developed re recurrence. Ultimately, we had to do a therapeutic full thickness graft in this case. Patch graft covered by Dr. Rajesh. Little bit on a cross-linked coronal tissue. I think the first time we reported that you can cross-link the donor tissue and uh, put in the fungal corneal ulcers. And it seems to do quite well in terms of prolongability of uh, clarity of these graphs and less chance of recurrence and less chances of wound-related problems. And uh, in the recent times, uh, Dr. Radhika has uh, are working on this area for uh, cross-linking the entire eye so that the host graph junction also gets cross-linked in these cases. That might do better in the future also. And uh, to summarize, the therapeutic uh, keratoplasty is a part of uh, management of infectious keratitis. Significant number of patients may require uh, these surgical interventions. It may be just a patch graft, it may be a glue, it may be lamella, it may be full thickness, but uh, that will save the uh, day for a patient because you can save the eye, you can do a future rehabilitation with these patients. If you have a bacterial, you have a better outcome. If you have fungal, yes, definitely less chances. But don't forget after surgery, the management would start subsequently, which may be more difficult than the pre-surgery management for these patients. I would acknowledge the National Eye Bank and my team for uh, helping this you know, poor patient getting through this uh, difficult time. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for that overview on therapeutic keratoplasty. We have uh, three minutes, so if there are any questions. Yes. is Poglas. How do you prepare a fuller disc to the The dermatologic punch to punch out. Use a two millimeter punch or a three millimeter punch and just punch out any sterile drape or any sterile plastic material that comes in your surgical tray. And that does not, uh, so the glue will stay on it and then you can You can peel the glue off from that. The glue doesn't stick to it. Thank you. Since regarding the fungal keratides, there has been well, inadequate use by the steroids by the kayakers and over the counter that uh, that worsens the condition of the ulcer. You know, you know correct. Uh, you know, the off the counter use of patients, uh, which is so commonly used in uh, in our country. And yes, that can really cause you know, uh, difficult fungal infections and difficult to manage. And most importantly, there's a rapid you know, progression of disease. Unlike the classical fungal ulcer, which is slow, progressive, here uh, with the steroid on, they can progress like a you know, pseudomonas ulcer. So sometimes the younger generation might mistake it as a you know, bacterial, but it can be a fungal infection. And you rightly pointed out the outcome in these cases is also difficult. Yes, one more to the, in addition to the vegetative trauma, we have the animal trauma like the cow tail injury, which can cause the fungal keratitis. Sure, sure. Any sort of a vegetative trauma or any trauma in the eye can cause any type of infections. Yes, more often it may be a fungal corneal ulcer, especially if you're working in a you know, agriculture field area, trauma in a working areas. They always predispose to uh, you know these ulcers, and fungal ulcer is the commonest one. And the other comment about worsening after two days of instituting treatment, one of the reasons can be that the patient was using steroids earlier, and when he came to you, you diagnosed it as a fungal keratitis, discontinued the steroids, and instituted antifungal, and then they start feeling that the eye symptoms have got worse, because previously the steroids were suppressing these symptoms. Yeah, absolutely true. <coughs> so I think uh, we can uh, now conclude the session. I'm thankful to all the people who came to attend the session. And for all their uh, comments and interactions, I'm thankful to all the speakers. Although we got the session 10 minutes late, but everybody finished before time or on time. And I would request the next uh, instructors of the next instruction course to please come on the dais. Actually, we should also thank Dr. Tuli, you know, coming all the way yes. from uh, Florida yeah, and enlightening us uh, with her talk. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Tuli. Mm -hmm. So can we have a quick photograph? <laughs>